Welcome or welcome back to my channel, friends. My name is Emily Elisha, and I'm so excited to have you here today because in this video, we're going to get to the part that we've all been waiting for. Just take a deep breath with me. And that part is when God's healing and acceptance knocks on the door of your tender heart. When God stitches you back together to take your eyes off of what's been lost and sets your sights on the light of his marvelous plan for your life. If you guys are like, whoa, what is she talking about? This is in regards to the series I started on this channel called Death, Grief, and Healing, inspired by what God taught me through the death of my beloved grandma. And this is part three, so I would absolutely recommend you to go back and watch part one and two. But like I've said before, each of these parts have a separate message, so that's not totally necessary. If you wanna just hear about healing and acceptance, you are more than welcome. And speaking of which, today we're gonna take a biblical dive into examples of how to finally heal, accept, and move on from the death of a loved one. And that is by setting your sights on what's ahead. So let's get into it. It's really important for you to know that God knows your pain. He knows your struggle, the devastation and the heartbreak that you went through. And he gives you time to recover. He gives you that rest. And this is evident in his word because we see how he treated the prophet Elijah when he was debilitatingly depressed. Now, Elijah brought fire from heaven. I mean, he was used so mightily by God, but then he became terribly afraid when the evil queen Jezebel threatened to kill him. I mean, he was depressed to the point of being suicidal and the Lord gave him time to rest. But he also strengthened him and encouraged him to get up and move forward instead of staying stuck in depression. And I want to read that to you from the word of God. First Kings chapter 19 verses three through eight. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom bush, sat under it, and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. All at once, an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, get up and eat for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. I feel like when a lot of people describe this event, they really emphasize on the rest, but the rest isn't emphasized. The get up is emphasized. The all at once is emphasized. The rest is important, but the get up is what God wants you to do. He wants you to get up. The strengthening is also very important because God cares about your body and he doesn't want you to stay stuck, depressed and decay. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit and the Lord wants to use your body to further his purpose in your life. Sometimes when we are depressed, we let go of hygiene, of schedules, of daily tasks. We forget about everything in our suffering and that is not God's plan for us. Now your flesh is gonna want to stay in a place of comfort. And there is nothing that the enemy wants more than for you to abort your mission. But God knows what you are capable of because he is the one that strengthens you. When other people in the world are grieving, not just for months, but for years, God has a supernatural way of putting you back together. And that is a testimony to glorify his name because other people are gonna say, how? How are you so happy after what happened to you and all the loss that you've experienced? But you have your faith and trust in God. He strengthens you in the time of trial because eventually it's gonna turn out good. It's not gonna stay there. 
I don't know if you've noticed, but every time I have a trial, every dark, dark moment of my life, it doesn't end there. That's the pre-suffering before the promotion. That's the testing before the testimony. You're going to have a testimony if you trust God through this process because you are not called to look, to act, and even heal like the world. You are called to rely on God's supernatural power to regenerate you, to restore you, and give you strength to move forward. Now, I want to look at another example from a time when Jesus himself was walking here on earth and he asked a man to follow him. Let's get into the word of God. Luke 9, 59 through 60 says, To another he, which is Jesus, said, Follow me. But he, which is the man, said, Lord, let me first go bury my father. And Jesus said to him, Leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Oh my goodness. When my grandmother died, this was the verse that would not leave me. The Holy Spirit kept bringing this Bible verse into remembrance because a lot of the family that I was around during her funeral and obviously events that preceded her passing were not saved. And so I wasn't to stay stuck in sorrow and depression My duty during that time was to proclaim the kingdom of God. I had a small movement of grieving. It didn't look anything like the world. And during that time when my family was very depressed, I mean, I saw people crying. I saw grown men crying. It was very sad. But during that time, I was full of joy, peace, and I was there to comfort. Oh my goodness. And I said, thank you, Lord. Like, I don't know where it came from because I've had other people die in my life and it was nothing like this. So back to the man who wanted to bury his dead father first, many people will think what Jesus told him was very harsh, but see the ways of this world are not like the kingdom of God. If you put on your spiritual lens powered by truth and you get rid of your carnal lens that's powered by tradition, you're gonna see that Jesus meant that in this case, there was no point to go bury his dead father because the Messiah was right in front of him. There was so much work to do. The world was about to change. There were lives to touch. So that is of more importance to God than to bury someone whose whose soul is no longer even in that body. See, God wants to use you for the living. He wants to use you for the presently needing and not the past deceased. We can celebrate their lives. We can honor their time on this earth, but we also have to understand that the past no longer exists. There's a lot of people who try to bring the dead back to life through mediums and and psychics and whatnot, which is obviously witchcraft and a sin. But why go there? The past no longer exists. And when we stay in the past, we're only hindering our great purpose. See, if you allow the past to keep you stuck, you will not move forward with your destiny. Believe it or not, these trials, these hardships are meant to propel you, to push you to face what's ahead. Blessings and purposes that not only affect you, but also affect your descendants, your bloodline, your children. I want to give you another example, and this time we're going to talk about King David. As we know from scripture, David one day caught a glimpse of a beautiful woman bathing outside. Her name was Bathsheba, and she was married to Uriah, who was a soldier under King David. So David ended up having an affair with Bathsheba and got her pregnant while Uriah was off in battle. So in order to conceal this pregnancy and get rid of any wrongdoing, David called back Uriah from the battlefield for a couple of days, expecting him to sleep with his wife. But Uriah did not sleep with his wife because of some warrior code of honor. And because of this, because David could not play off Bathsheba's pregnancy as having anything to do with Uriah, he had him killed. Now this was a terrible sin in God's eyes. And just because King David was blessed, anointed, and truly God's favorite, did not exempt him from punishment. Seven days after the child of David and Bathsheba was born, the baby died. 
I know this is horrible. And I wanna highlight David's grieving process after suffering the loss of a baby and also knowing that all of that guilt was upon him. So let's get into the word of God. And I know this is a lot of scripture, but bear with me, it is rich, meaningful, and it has a purpose. 2 Samuel 12, verses 13 through 24, then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, the Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. But because by doing this, you have made the enemies of the Lord show utter contempt, the son born to you will die. After Nathan had gone home, the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife had born to David. Let's pause there. Do you see how he called Bathsheba Uriah's wife? See, what David did was illegal. Bathsheba was Uriah's wife in the Lord's sight. Let's continue. The Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife had born to David, and he became ill. David pleaded with God for the child. He fasted and went into his house and spent the nights lying on the ground. The elders of his household stood beside him to get him up from the ground, but he refused. He would not eat any food with them. On the seventh day, the child died. David's servants were afraid to tell him that the child was dead, for they thought, while the child was still alive, we spoke to David, but he would not listen to us. How can we tell him the child is dead? He may do something desperate. Pause. So they were afraid that David might harm himself, do something wild because we see that this is how the world grieves. The designer McQueen took his life after his mother died. Let's get back into it. He may do something desperate. David noticed that his servants were whispering among themselves. He realized the child was dead. Is the child dead? He asked. Yes, they replied. He is dead. Then David got up from the ground after he had washed, put on lotions, and changed his clothing. He went into the house of the Lord and worshiped. Then he went to his own house, and at his request, they served him food and he ate. His servants asked him, why are you acting this way? While the child was alive, you fasted and wept. But now that the child is dead, you get up and eat? He answered, while the child was still alive, I fasted and wept. I thought, who knows? The Lord may be gracious to me and let the child live. But now that he is dead, why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I will go to him, but he will not return to me. Then David comforted his wife Bathsheba, and he went to her and lay with her. She gave birth to a son, and they named him Solomon. The Lord loved him. Wow. Wow, 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 wow. I don't know if you guys caught that, but I caught so many gems through reading all of the scripture. The world will think you're insane for being at peace in the midst of a huge storm. How could anyone get over something so tragic so quickly? That's because David understood God's sovereignty. He understood that God was in control and that there was nothing else that he could do. When you submit to God's will, it will give you peace. That will help you move forward. Instead of staying behind, saying, what could I have done? I should have done this. Why didn't I do that? Well, there's no point anymore. If David were to stay stuck in shame, guilt, and despair, Solomon wouldn't have been born. God restored what David lost because David was sorry. He was repentant and he trusted the Lord. Don't think that your fasting and your prayers go unnoticed and unheard. This loss pushed David into his destiny and into God's mighty purpose that goes beyond him. And that was to produce Israel's wisest king. Now Solomon built God's temple. He wrote the book of Proverbs, Songs of Solomon. We have so much to be grateful for David moving forward. Trust God because what was lost was beautiful in its time. But God has something better for you. See, these trials are not meant to kill us. Yes, they burn, but they are meant to polish and refine us and catapult us. You take some steps back, but then it's like, poof, you are shooting, flying towards what God has for you, and you're flying towards what's ahead, like a slingshot. Now, I wanna give you my last example 
of when Jesus lost his dear friend and cousin, John the Baptist. Through scripture, I'm gonna show you how the Lord did not let this stop him or deter him from his call into ministry and helping others, but it actually furthered him and pushed him into it. Matthew 14, 13 through 14 says, when Jesus heard what had happened, and this is referring to John the Baptist's death, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. So Jesus was obviously heartbroken over the news of John's passing and he wanted to be alone. But see that suffering didn't stop him from doing what God had called him to do. Sometimes we as humans can't see past our own suffering and past our own pain. And in those hard moments, we don't feel like talking and we don't feel like helping anyone else. But see, this is what I learned at an inner healing course, which really shook me and made me look in the mirror very hard and ask the Lord for help. They told me that self-pity is pride. I was like, dang, okay. I have a lot of pride then because I have bouts of self-pity. This course taught me that when you have self-pity, you are focusing all the attention on yourself and pride is all about self. But the opposite of pride is humility. And we see here how Jesus didn't put himself or his desire to be alone first. Instead, he had compassion on them and healed the sick. Let's see what happens next. Matthew 14, 15 through 20. As evening approached, the disciples came to him, Jesus, and said, this is a remote place and it's getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Jesus replied, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. So the disciples said, we have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here to me, Jesus said and he directed the people to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples. The disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. Isn't it interesting that before it gets really good, it gets really bad? Now the enemy will have us try to stay bad because he doesn't want us to get what's good. This is one of the major miracles that Jesus did. And this just wasn't between him and his disciples. This is so the whole crowd could see the miracles of God, evidence of the true Messiah. Now this miracle could have only been made possible because of Jesus's obedience to serve others. If he would have stayed stuck in depression, mourning over the loss of John the Baptist, if he would have turned those people away, we would have never had this rejoicing miracle to talk about into the future. Now, I do wanna say that during this period of loss and grief, there absolutely might be bouts of anger and frustration. And I'm speaking for myself. It is so hard to see past your own pain and suffering during these dark times. So don't condemn yourself if that's been you. However, let's look at Jesus and that amazing example, being attuned to the Holy Spirit, because yes, he can still use you during your darkest moments. God understands your suffering and your recovery process, but don't sit there for too long. Don't let it become an idol and stealing what God wants to do in your life. I do, however, wanna highlight this point. Jesus did recognize his need for the Father and the Lord's regenerating power. Now, after Jesus fed the 5,000, this is what he did next. Matthew 14, 22 through 23. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. This tells me that our healing matters to God. Jesus was humble enough to go to the Father when he needed to be refreshed, to be restored, and to be replenished. On the opposite end of everything we're talking about are those people who live in denial. They just get up, get to work. Okay, okay, I wanna forget everything. I wanna stay busy. I don't wanna think about the past. 
And that is not true healing. That is gonna come back to bite you. One day you're just gonna pop off. And I've done that before. I have. <laughs> yeah, it's not, it's not pretty. It's not. You were not designed to run dry. You were not designed to function empty. The Lord wants to strengthen us and pour into us when we are weak. So in times of trouble, you will be full. You will be overflowing and you yourself can pour into someone else's empty cup. Prayer is our weapon and the word of God is our nourishment. And the way that we can hold on to hope is by reading the word and remember God's promises. And this is one that's going to comfort you. 1 Thessalonians 4 verses 13 through 17. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind. Wow. Who have no hope. I'm going to repeat that so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. And that's the good news, that if your loved one accepted Jesus Christ sometime in their life, or maybe at the very end of their life, you will see them in heaven one day. So have hope and even have hope for yourself. Revelation 21, four says, he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. Hallelujah. Praise God. He is so good. Hold on to the promises of the Lord. If you need encouragement, if you forget if the world, the devil, your flesh, are clouding your mind and distracting you from the truth, go back to the word of God. He will give you hope into your true healing because that's something only the Lord can do. Only he can heal you. Other things will not heal you. Denial won't heal you. Distractions won't heal you. Drugs won't heal you. Addictions won't heal you. Watching TV is not going to heal you. What's going to heal you is spending time with the father so that he pours into that empty cup. And it is so beautiful. Praise the Lord. Well, guys, I'm so glad that you made it through this video. In the next video, I'm going to tell you my testimony of how I healed and how I saw God's supernatural power confirmation through the death of my grandma. You're not going to want to miss that. So please like subscribe and turn on that notification bell so that you get notified when my next video is posted. Thank you again and God bless you.